With nearly a dozen Grammys, Drama Desk, and Academy Awards, he has definitely conquered the role of composer. He had three shows running simultaneously on Broadway and helped DreamWorks Studios enter the world of animation. His work for the stage has included Pippin, Godspell, and Wicked. And his work for animated films can be heard on The Prince of Egypt, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Pocahontas. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on Interviews, our exclusive conversation with lyricist and composer Stephen Schwartz. does a song come to life for you? Um, In pieces, actually, uh, mostly. Usually um, I get an idea about the specific assignment of the song, where it's going to fall in the show or the movie, because that's generally what I'm writing for, is something which has a larger arc to it than just one song. But even if it's an individual song, it's what's the song about, what's the emotional journey of the song, who's singing it, why is he or she singing it, and so on. And, and to try to come to uh, decisions about that, or at least a starting point about that. Um, over the years, through experience, I've come to like to start with a title. So a lot of times I just try and get a title. But um, when is the moment that you realize it's born. Is it when you hear the melody in your head the first time? Is it when it's sung by someone? At what no, point? I think it's when it's finished. I think, I think it's when the song is done and I can type up all the lyrics on the computer and print them out and I can sit at the piano and play through it and sing through it. Then that feels to me like, that feels to me as if now the song exists. It's out in the world and well, something can happen to it or not, but it's, it's born. Do you sit around and play your own music? After it's written? Yeah. Very, very rarely. No, really? No. Yeah, I just, I mean, usually I have something else to write. Right. So I'm, I'm moving on to whatever the next uh, piece is. Um, and then the, the act of sort of writing and getting, getting it together um, is, is sufficient for me. I, I do have friends who are songwriters and they like to listen to their records and you go to their houses and it's, the music is playing in the background or they have, they have it as hold music, if you call them. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not like one of those. I Generally, once a CD that I've done is completed, it sits in a shrink wrap in my little shelf and that's it. How do you maintain a sense of style when you're writing something for theater or film where each one has to take on the character of the project? Where do we find you in the finished product? Well, I think it's unavoidable for the writer to be there. I I think the opposite problem obtains, actually, that how can you submerge yourself enough so that whatever the song is or whatever the musical number is, it comes out feeling appropriate to the character uh, or characters who are singing it, um, and it's not, oh, there's Stephen doing his his thing again. There's that chord that he always uses and so on. I mean, that, that I think is the more difficult Are thing. Are you conscious of that then? When you're writing, do you think about that or do you just I, I've started it... to be a little bit more conscious about really? repeating and trying not to repeat myself and recognizing, oh, I always do that. Maybe I should try to do something different here. Sort of in terms of certain harmonic structures, uh, certain ways that lyrics are structured, I've, I've started to see that um, i I can fall into patterns, and, and I try to break that up a little bit if I, if I have the guts. First show you wrote? The very, very first show yeah, I wrote? The very first. The very first show I wrote was a puppet show um, when I was about <laughs> seven or eight called High Dog, which all I remember about it was that it was the heart-rending story of a dog who runs away from home and a little boy who's his master, whatever you call it, has to go and find him. And, um, my sister and I performed it using her dolls and puppets for <laughs> my parents and, and I think uh, uh, some other unlucky relatives who happened to be present at the time. Critical success? Um, well, on the surface, it was a critical success. I, <laughs> I don't know how they actually felt underneath. Where did the love for theater come from then? 
Um, I, I just got bitten by the bug, as I think many people do, from the very, very first time that I saw live theater. Uh, it was really love at first sight, and I'm sure there are complex psychological reasons for that that maybe I don't want to look at too closely. But <laughs> it, it was instantaneous and sort of lifelong. I never got over it. Your son works in the theater, too. Yes, he does. Very successful director. Yeah. Was there something in his upbringing that you instilled that, or did you see the same thing happen with him? He was just bit by that. Point. No, I saw the same thing happen. Um, f I remember he was going to be furious at me for, for saying this in public, but I remember when he was a kid, first of all, he did the same thing. He used to put on little shows in the house and kind of bully his friends and relatives into, into being in the shows with him, and he was always bossing everybody around and telling them what to do. And then often we would see him walking around in the, in the backyard, particularly kind of walking around and around the pool and kind of gesturing and talking to himself. And clearly he was making up stories and enacting uh, whatever dramas were going on in his head. So it was always there from the time he was a kid. And he did some children's theater, you know, because that's what you can do when you're young. You can go and be in shows, etc. cetera. Um, and then in, I think it was 10th grade in high school, he directed um, a production of uh, black comedy at his school. And I was actually not there. I didn't see it. I was in England working on something. But I got a call from his mom. And she said, uh, well, I know what your son is going to do for a living. And she told me about this production of black comedy that he directed. And I remember saying, oh, that's so cute and how charming. And isn't that adorable that they let him do that? And she said, no, 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 you're, you're not hearing me. I'm telling you, this is it. And, and it, she was absolutely right. It was it. And he never looked back. From your experiences in theater, and you hear that your child wants to do the same thing, fear or joy for him? Um, a, sort of a mixture of both. Uh, the thing that I felt about with Scott was that he certainly was not going to go into professional theater with any illusions or any romantic idea of what kind of business it was because he'd certainly seen the lumps that I took and the hard times that I had. I mean, I think I went in with much more naivete and, and a much more deluded idea of what it was to work in the professional theater. And I thought, listen, if he's making this choice, at least in this case, it's, it's an informed choice. And he's not going to suddenly have a disappointment as to what the business really is. So I, I didn't have too much concern in, in that regard. And he's a very smart guy. And I figured, you know, if this didn't take, he'd find something else to do. Now, when you were in college, if I understand correctly, when you left school, when you were done, you already had four musicals under your belt. Yeah, I went to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And um, I was a drama major there. And um, part of what was good about Carnegie Mellon was that there was a, an extracurricular organization which had absolutely nothing to do with the drama department called Scotch and Soda that put on an original musical every year. And I sort of wormed my way in there in my freshman year, and I wound up co-writing the show all four years that I was there. And that was extraordinary experience because it was doing an absolutely brand new musical from scratch yeah. four times. And that was, I learned a lot from that. And the third show that I did um, my junior year was a show called Pippin Pippin, um, which transmogrified, shed one of its uh, monikers and, uh, and transmogrified ultimately into the Broadway show Pippin. How much of that's the same if we were to have a copy of Pippin Pippin? Not a word, not a note. Really? Yeah. All, all that's the same is the, uh, are the characters' names and the kernel of the historical uh, event. Um, the Pippin, Pippin at Carnegie was sort of in line in winter mode, which was very popular with all of us drama folks at, right. at Carnegie when I was there because, you know, we all went around saying the sort of like witty dialogue to one another. <laughs> and uh, my friend Ron Strauss had come across a, uh, a paragraph in a history textbook in a class he was taking about the son of Charlemagne and a plot that he had gotten involved in to try and overthrow his father, an unsuccessful plot. And we thought, oh, wouldn't this be fun to have court intrigue and betrayal and people, you know, plotting behind one another's backs a la Lion in Winter. And so that's really what the show was. Uh, at Carnegie. And then as it developed over the six years between that point and the time it appeared on Broadway, it sort of changed into being this 
uh, semi-autobiographical tale of a young man in search of him, what to do with his life. And the, the historical kernel became sort of um, a MacGuffin, if you will. Yeah. In those six years, though, there's a little thing called Godspell that happens. Yeah, that, 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 that came, came along. along. As I understand it, there was the show Godspell done before you even got involved in the project. Completely. Correct? Oddly enough, um, that came out of Carnegie Mellon as well. But it began at Carnegie Mellon after I was gone. And um, it was the brainchild of the director, John Michael Teblak, whom I had known at school but um, didn't, I knew him before he was beginning to think about working on Godspell. And what had happened was when I came to New York and acquired an agent and she took me around to play Pippin for a bunch of producers to see if we could interest anybody in, in doing it, um, among the producers that she introduced me to um, was a team, uh, uh, Edgar Lansbury and Joseph Baru. And they were not interested in Pippin at all. But lo and behold, some nine months later or so after I played the score for them, I got a call out of the blue from their office saying that they had seen this show at an off-off-Broadway theater, uh, Godspell, and that they were interested in moving it to off-Broadway, but they felt it needed a score because it just had a couple of songs that kids in the show had written and so on. And um, they remembered me from the Pippin audition, would I go to see it? So I went down to the Café La Mama to see it, and lo and behold, there were all these people from Carnegie Mellon, um, <laughs> a couple of whom I, I knew pretty well. Yeah. So how free are you then to rework something like that? When you walk in, is there a sense you must retain what they had before? How free are you to redevelop? Well, in this case, that didn't really arise because what they had was working. Um, Basically, the show that opened at the Cherry Lane Theater was pretty close to the show that I saw at the Cafe La Mama. Um, we put some cuts in. Of course, there were songs put in. There was choreography. Um, and there were a few little changes, which you know I felt very comfortable to suggest, though ultimately those decisions were John Michael's. Right. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I, didn't, I wasn't shy about it. I'm, I'm never really shy about adaptation. But... It was the, the show was clearly working when I saw it, so it's not like it needed a big overhaul. Plus, the fact is that from the day that I saw it to the day we went into rehearsal, there were five weeks. So there wasn't a whole oh, lot wow. of time to do anything <laughs> except sit at the piano and try and bang out some songs. Yeah. What do you think when you look back on that work? What's your critical ear for it? Well, my work or the work itself? Your work. Um, there are things that I like about it. Um, there are some lyrics that I find pretty embarrassing that I, th I think I would do better now. Yeah. Um, but I think that because I was 23 years old and more or less so was everybody else working on the show, my sensibility sort of fit with the sensibility of the show. And so I think it does sort of exist all of the piece. Um, and in, in that regard, I, I think what I came up with worked pretty well. Um, and I still think it's, it's an amazing concept, which I can take no credit for because it's, it's John Michael Teblak. And somehow he had the, the inspiration 2,000 years after uh, the New Testament was written that you could do something based on the New, New Testament that was not satirical of it and was very, very funny. And no one else had ever done that material before and, and be funny. That, that's an amazing insight. Well, before, right before, basically, Godspell, there was Jesus Christ Superstar. Yeah, and got an which awful is hardly lot of, a lot of laughs. Right, yeah, and had a lot of controversy with it. Yeah. Did you guys meet a lot of the similar, or did you skirt that? It's interesting what's happened. Godspell is much more controversial now, in, in America at least, than it was then, because of the rise of fundamentalism in America. And, and um, you know, the 70s were not a particularly fundamentalist time. It was, to the contrary, a time when everything was being re-examined and um, looked at anew and decisions made of, on is this valid for contemporary life and so on and so forth. So because Godspell is so sort of true to the spirit uh, and the teachings that are contained within the book of Matthew and the, a couple of the other passages from which it draws, um, we actually didn't encounter a whole lot of controversy. There was a little bit. But, you know, the, it was performed for two popes and nuns and priests were always in the audience. You know, it was, it was actually pretty popular with the religious set, if you will. And, of course, it transformed in many ways 
religious services because all of a sudden everybody was playing rock music and, and during religious services and stuff on Sundays. Now, in some of the more fundamentalist and conservative red state areas of America, the show is, gets banned. Banned? So, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and you have, like, you know, the usual thing where a parent complains and the terrified school board withdraws it and, you know, just all this craziness that's happening in America now. As one of the parents of that, though, how do you feel when you hear these kind of things? Well, I mean, I, I'm not very happy with what's going on in America now in a lot of regards, and, and this is just, you know, one example. Yeah. Okay, then you come to a show I love, Magic Show. Oh, thank and the you. The thing that strikes me funny about that is I didn't realize how long that actually ran because everyone it talks ran a long about time, yeah, like Pippin five or six and years. Godspell, yeah. but they forget. Yeah. The Magic Show had a long life. It did, uh, oddly enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, again, I think it was something that parents could take their kids to see without being absolutely bored to tears themselves. And if you can come up with a show like that, that, that tends to give you a little bit of a long life uh, on Broadway. So I think that's, that's what happened there. And of course, it made a star out of Doug Henning, the, the magician who originally starred in it and, and, and around whose illusions the, the show was devised. Is it hard for you at that age to have had three big successes all right in a row? Does that make the next work harder? I mean, I'm assuming after Godspell, then Pippin seemed hard, and after Pippin, then Magic Show, and after right. that. I mean, is that setting you up for a fall? Sure. I mean, I, I don't know that it made the work harder, but it, it, I found it very difficult to cope with in many ways. I found it difficult to cope with internally. Um, I think that I went on both a bit of an ego trip, and I also um, over-dramatized the sort of um, resentment and resistance that I felt from people in the theater community, you know, who after all had been working a long time, and here was some kid who came out of nowhere, and by the time he was 26 years old, or however old I was when Magic Show opened, he had three hits running on Broadway, you know, this didn't make me very popular yeah. with a lot of my peers. And so there was a lot of controversy and a lot of... Um, dissension that, that, that I felt, or maybe dissension's the wrong word, but, but resentment. And that was difficult for me to deal with, and um, I was very tired, ultimately, because I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off. And yeah, I think, I think I was definitely set up for a fall. And also, as I mentioned earlier, talking about Scott, my illusions about working in the theater and how convivial and collegial and, and exciting that was going to be had all been totally shattered by that point and I realized what a, what a tough and mean business it is. Okay, one question that I have to ask about is you've got Oscars, Emmy, Grammy. No, Tony. I don't have an Emmy. You don't have an Emmy? No. Tony. No, I'm very, I'm very, very bifurcated. I have, I have Oscars and Grammys and, and no Tonys and no Emmys. Does that surprise you? Well, it seems ironic to me in that the if I felt I was ever going to get, you know, one of those sort of awards, which I'm not a big fan of anyway, because I think they're all corrupt and nonsense. Do you um, feel that way on the night that they announce your name at the Academy Awards? Well, I think you know how much of a sort of political situation they are. I have to say, because um, I'm an Academy voter now because of, of, of winning the Oscar, I have to say that of all the awards that I know of, the way the voting procedure works for the Oscars is actually by far the fairest. It's, it's oddly enough the least political. Um, really? Yeah, because you have to see everything and there's certain categories that you, you cannot vote in at all if you, have, if you can't prove that you've seen all the films and um, you know the, the nominations are done by the various groups like the music branch nominates the music um, awards, et cetera. And then everybody votes on all of them. But it's, it's actually the fairest system that, that I can see. I mean, compared to some of the other awards, which are completely corrupt and nonsense, <laughs> the, the, the Academy Awards are, 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 oddly enough, sort of a bastion of fairness. Yeah. But yeah, I think all of them are Is nuts. it hard working in the studio system? Is it hard working for, like, a Disney when you've been out there in what we assume in the theater world is much more open and creative? Um, I haven't found it to be so. Um, somewhat to my surprise. You, I haven't done a lot of live action, and I, I think that the studio system is more prevalent and maybe more difficult when you're dealing with live action features. Um, the animated, doing animation, which is mostly my experience in films, um, is very, very similar to working uh, um, in the theater, actually, in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, I just 
there were there were a group of people collaborating. And yes, when you're working for Jeffrey Katzenberg, you're working for Jeffrey Katzenberg, and, and the buck is going to stop there. But it's not all that different from, from the buck stopping with a strong director. So See, I think we have the, the stereotypic idea that Hollywood, a lot of suits interfering. Broadway is more of these creative guys sitting around a piano with a drink, writing and plugging away on a show. Um, I think there is validity to that, but it actually hasn't been my personal experience. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You go back to theater in a big way now. Wicked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that turned out to be in a big way. Yeah, a huge way. Yeah. And the thing that strikes me so interesting about that whole story is that the involvement with the other creative sources all the way through it. And I mean that by there were casts that were in it from the beginning readings. Yeah. And it seems as though you wrote for particular people, that things were done for actors or certain designers as the work was created instead of the work being created and then the people being put in. Why did it go that way? Well, for one thing, I had learned a lot. Um, and there, there was a way that I felt I needed to work to do a show, particularly a, a big and expensive show that has a, an awful lot of pressure yeah. on it from, from the get-go. And, um, and I'd also learned stuff from doing animation and the way um, things get developed w within the Disney system and then subsequently at DreamWorks because they basically did the same thing when Jeffrey went over there. Um, and so I was able to bring a lot of the sort of bitter experience to bear and say, look, these are mistakes that I've made in the past and pitfalls I've fallen into in the, in the past. Just talking procedurally and in terms of process and, and uh, I'm not going to do that again. And so the way Wicked was developed oh, with... Um, many readings over a period of time and the gradual accumulation of, as you say, a couple of the actors. I mean, Kristen Chenoweth was with us for three years, basically. Right. Not that she, it's not as if it was the only thing she was doing, but from the very first reading we did of the full show, um, Kristen was there, and, um, and yes, a, a lot of the writing of the part of Glinda was very much influenced. Um, by Kristen. Then don't you run the risk of, if you don't have that actor, then the part doesn't work. How do you make sure that you're writing something that is going to be universal enough that people can play it as opposed to it being one person's signature role? Well, oddly enough, I find the, uh, the opposite obtains. It's sort of counterintuitive. But if you can make something work really well for a particular performer, unless, you, unless it's something that absolutely nobody else can do, but if you can really make a part work well for a particular performer, then other people will be able to bring something to it. I mean, think about Gypsy and, and the character of Mama Rose, written very, very specifically and very consciously for Ethel Merman, and yet it is a role that many, many great musical theater actresses have played and com done completely differently than Ethel Merman, but the role itself is so rich. Yeah. What about taking something such as Wicked and altering it from its original source? And the book is considerably different than the musical ends right. up. Is there a sense that you have to stay true to one, or is it a different creature so you can be free on it? No, I felt it was a different creature. I mean, what, what I liked about Wicked, what I fell in love with about Wicked was the idea, the concept, which again, I think is, is a, a flash of genius that, that you Gregory Maguire had. You were snorkeling with Holly I was. Neer, and she was Holly Neer. Holly Neer, the folk singer, said to me on a boat back from a snorkel trip, I'm reading this really interesting book. And as soon as I heard the idea of this book, I just thought, this is the best idea I've ever heard. And in so many ways, it's so me. It's, su it's such a project that is perfect for me. Um, and so that's what I fell in love with. And then when I read the book, of course, there was a lot to draw from, but I... I read the book from page one with the idea that I wanted to adapt it. So I was already reading it in that regard. I was thinking, well, this would work, but actually, what if you dropped this, or what if you took this idea and, and made more of it, and so on. So I was already thinking as an adapter. So when you first heard then that a movie studio had the rights to it, why did you think you can go and fight it as opposed to, well, I'll just do something different like it? Well, I, I, I didn't. As a matter of fact, what happened was, as soon as I heard about the book on this famous snorkel trip with Holly Neer, <laughs> um, and when I got back to the mainland, to Los Angeles, I called my representative and I said, okay, someone has the rights to this book because it's already out in paperback. Someone's bought it. Who's bought it? Because I want to go and see if I can do it. And it turned out to be universal. Then I got very lucky 
because it was Mark Platt at Universal, uh, a movie executive who not only had a love for an understanding of musical theater, but had actually been in Pippin in college. <laughs> so, um, you know, I wasn't, my entreaties were not falling on entirely deaf ears, though it took a while to persuade Mark because they were a ways down the road trying to come up with a screenplay to do Wicked as a non-musical movie. Um, and there was a little bit of a dark time when I thought it wasn't going to happen. And I did, in fact, think, well, what else could I do? Could I do Iago? Could I do Judas? Could I do The Wicked Queen from Snow White? And I sort of looked at all the um, iconographic villains to see if there was one that sort of sparked me in the same way. But nothing. I didn't fall in love with any of them the way, the way I did with, uh, with Alphaba and Wicked. Yeah. Are you done with it? Is, is the show finished and complete as far as you see? I see times going back and reworking old shows or kind of getting involved. Is this thing set and finished? Well, we made a couple of changes for London, actually. Oh, really? London just opened, what, a week ago? And um, there was one scene in the second act that's always bugged me. And, uh, and I managed to get it to bug everybody else by harping on it for a long time. And, so, and we, I think we've improved it. I think we, we've... Uh, we may have fixed it, and it's certainly better. And then there was a section of the first act that had always bugged Joe Montello, our very talented director, and he sort of harangued us until Winnie and I said, all right, all right, we'll fix it. So I, I think we did. So we've made little improvements, and, you know, who knows? When we do it in... Uh, um, the next time we do it, we may, we may find some more. When that next time comes, I hope you'll join us again. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure and a treat. Oh, thank you. Stephen Schwartz. It was fun. Thanks a lot, man. Transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest. Mm-hmm.